Well, today I'm going to be talking about David's faith. And at least David's faith in God. And the last two weeks, Jody's been talking about Joshua, and, and we've learned a lot about faith over the last few weeks. And we're not really going to delve deep into David's life. We really can't do that with the, the time we have now, but it's going to be kind of a, a bird's eye view of, of David's faith and, and really how our faith should be similar. And we're going to hop right into this. We've got a lot, to, a lot of ground to cover with the time that we have, but you hang on tight, have you, hold on to your Bible, and we're trusting that God's going to speak to our, our hearts today because he wants to do a, a work in our life. He, he's already doing that, but he wants to continue. This work that he started, he's going to complete it. So we're going to start out in Hebrews 11. This is uh, the main text out of Hebrews 11. That's where we've been at in this, in this series that we're in. And we're going to look at verse 32 through 34. And it says, and what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouth of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword. Who, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. So here we look at, in this text, where you have a list of, of men who's warriors. We have people that are, are prophets that, through faith, they saw God do miraculous things. They saw victories that were accomplished in battle. They saw that God gave them wisdom to guide his people justly. And God provided a way of escape when they were at a disadvantage. And that's, that's truly David's testimony as we look into his life. So David was, he was born in, in Bethlehem, just like Jesus was. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at when God called him to be king of Israel. We're going to go to 1 Samuel 16. We're going to start at verse 1, but then we're going to skip down a little bit just, to, just so we can save some time today. Now something about David God saw something in David, he did, and something that wasn't visible to the eye. God saw David's heart. 1 Samuel 16, verse 1, it says, Now the Lord said to Samuel, You have mourned long enough for Saul. I have rejected him as king of Israel. So fill your flax with olive oil and go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there. For I have selected one of his sons to be my king. I want to pause there for a second just to kind of give you a, some context of what's going on. David will be Israel's second king. There was already one king that was in place. His name was Saul, but Saul wasn't obedient. Saul, if you look in Saul's life, the story was always about Saul. You know, it, it was his kingdom. It's, he, he, he started out well, but he took his eyes off, off of God. And so God rejected him. And so God is, is going to have a replacement king for Israel. And this is what we're picking up at right here. So Samuel is going to look for David. We're going to pick up at verse 6. It says, Then they arrived. Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by the outward appearance, 
but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse told his son Abinadab to step forward and walk in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, this is not the one the Lord has chosen. Next, Jesse summoned Shemia. But Samuel said, neither is this the one the Lord has chosen. In the same way, all seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Then Samuel asked, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse replied, but he's out in the fields watching the sheep and goats. Send for him at once, Samuel said. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes. Doesn't sound like a warrior, does it? Yeah, I don't think that's on the prerequisite list. And the Lord said, this is the one, anoint him. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil he had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Then Samuel returned to Ramah. God sees David's heart in this story. He's not like He's not like people. He's not like us. He sees right into our, our hearts. He's, he knows what's, what's going on. And that's true for us. God sees right into our hearts. He knows what's going on in our, in our life. And that doesn't have to be a, a fearful thing, you know, because sometimes everything in our, inside our heart is not right, you know, if, if we're, we're honest. But the thing about it is, it's an opportunity for us to draw closer to God. It really is. God already sees the things that's, that's in our heart, but he loves us. So what he's doing is he's, he's drawing us closer to him. So those, those things that aren't right, he can change. So those things that aren't right, he can move them out of the way. That our relationship with him can be transparent and it can be genuine. He's, he wants to move those things out of our way. And, and I would say also, on the other side of that, if, if we don't want to be transparent with God, then we, we, don't, we don't get transformed. We're not transformed. Those things that, that hinder us, hinder our relationship with God, they remain there in the way. It's kind of like Adam and Eve, if you remember. They, when they sinned, they, they tried to hide themselves. They didn't come to God. But God is telling us to, to come towards him. And so, but David, you know, David was not a perfect man. He was not, not by any means at all. But the thing about David is that when he did make a mistake, when he did sin or, or do something wrong, he would re repent, he would, he would change. And, and you've heard this before, when we say repent, that means it's, if I'm going this direction right here, and it's the wrong direction, I need to change course and, and go uh, this direction, right? So if, if this, this direction is wrong, and it's leading away from God, it's not pleasing to God, I need to do a course correction. I, I need to turn that way. And that's, that's, that's who David was. You know, he wasn't perfect, but when he knew he did something wrong, he would change. The Bible says that David was a, a man after God's own heart. And he knew that God would, would hear his prayer. A lot of the Psalms were written by David. He was very transparent with God. And we're going to read one of these, uh, Psalms 130. It's not a very long Psalm. It's only eight, eight verses. And some of the uh, scholars, some of the Theologians say that this is a song of accent, and it was possibly one of the songs that the, the people of, of the Israelites would sing as they were going to the temple to do their sacrifices and, and, and worship. And as we read this, you'll see why. It's an opportunity for us to um, just be open to God and, and for him to, to do a work in our life. Psalms 130. And this is David. It says, 
From the depths of despair, O Lord, I call for your help. Hear my cry, O Lord. Pay attention to my prayer. Lord, if you keep a record of our sins, who, O Lord, could ever survive? But you offer forgiveness that we might learn to fear you. I am counting on the Lord. Yes, I am counting on him. I have put my hope in his word. I long for the Lord more than the centuries long for the dawn. Yes, more than centuries long for the dawn. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is unfailing love. His redemption overflows. He himself will redeem Israel from every kind of sin. In this psalm, we, we find that David, he said he's, he's counting. He's counting on God. He's, I'm counting on you, Lord. Because he knew that's where his help was going to come from. It wasn't going to come from any other place. It was, it was going to come from him. And I like this, this imagery that they, they put of this, this century in this, this psalm about a century as a guard, somebody that would be standing guard. And, and we get this image of maybe a fort, and this sentry is possibly on the wall of the fort, just kind of looking into the, the night, just can't see much, but he's on guard. But at some point, he knows that the dawn is going to crest over the horizon. At some point, he knows, hey, I'm going to be able to see what's out there. I'm going to be able to see clearly. So he's expecting Church, we have to expect that God is going to hear our prayers. We do. He's a good father. In John, 1 John 5, verses 14 and 15, it's not on the screen, but it's in, in the notes online. It says that if we ask anything, and it's according with his will, he hears us. He says, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. It has to be in his will, though. And not only that, it says that if he hears us, then we have that request that we, we've asked for. There's, there's an assurance there. In Psalms 130, David talks about he's waiting on the Lord. He, he's, he's counting on God. And that, that term wait there, when you look it up, it doesn't mean just to wait and not have a purpose. It doesn't just mean to wait idly. It means to wait with an expectation. It means to, to have a, a, an assurance that something is gonna, something's gonna happen. When we're waiting for someone, we have an expectation that at some point they're gonna show up. Eventually, you know, we've made, we've cooked dinner, we've done something, that eventually they're gonna come. We expect that. David says that he's expecting to, for God to show up in his situation. He doesn't know exact, the exact moment, but he knows that God's going to be coming. And, and you know, that's faith. That's faith. Having the assurance that at some point God's going to show up in our, in our life. And we only wait for people that we expect to show up. You know, if, if there's somebody that, that's not very responsible, then you don't wait. You're like, no, I'm, 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 gonna, I'm not going to set my agenda around that person because it's going to fall through. Sometimes I fear we do the same thing with God. If he doesn't show up when we expect him to show up, we move on. We talked about... Abraham and, and Sarah, how, you know, they were waiting for God, but it had taken so long. Thought, well, I think God needs some help. And they tried to do it themselves. That expectation started waning. I, I think sometimes we get that way ourselves. We do. We start trying to do things on our own. Church, we have to have the faith that God's going to show up. We have to wait expectantly. And how long? How long we have to wait? I'm not God, I, I, can't, I can't give you an answer. But we wait until he does show up. We wait until we hear from him. And the thing about it is that sometimes God may say no. 
he, he may have already given us the answer and, and we don't like it and we're waiting for another answer. We may have already gotten our answer. But faith is saying that even though I'm waiting or God has told me no, that he knows what's best. And somehow he's going to work this out for my good. That's faith. But that comes out of relationship too. That comes out of, uh, of having a trust in God that hey, his, his, his thoughts towards me are good. I don't fully understand it yet. I will. But that's relationship. Isaiah 40 talks about this too. And um, we're going to look at verse 27 down through 31. Because we do have to wait on, on God. God is not on our timetable. We're on his timetable. God's not waiting on us. <laughs> we wait on him. Amen. Amen. So Isaiah 40, verse 27, it says, O oh, Jacob, how can you say the Lord does not see your troubles? That'll make you think for a second. O oh, Israel, how can you say God ignores your rights? Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depth of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youth will become weak and tired and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust, some say wait, some versions say wait, in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. That's what happens when we wait expectantly on, on the Lord. He's going to show up at some point in our life. And even then, we find the grace that we need to wait on God. We find the strength that we need to wait on God. When we wait expectantly upon him, he will show up at some, at some point. Because all of us are going through some kind of circumstance. I mean, there's a lot of different faces in here, and every one of us got a situation that we're going through. That's just life. But God gives us the grace. He gives us the strength. And he is at some point going to show up in our circumstance. And that brings us to point two. Point one was that David knew that God, he had faith that God was going to hear his prayer. Point two is that David's faith grew through his experiences with God. David had experiences that over time, just, they were like building blocks. They, they just helped him understand, helped him trust God more. When he had volunteered to fight Goliath, Goliath was this, this, this Philistine giant, he recalled the victories that God had done in his life and in times past. And we're going to look at 1 Samuel 17, verses 32 down to 37. And just to kind of set the table for this and let, uh, let you know what was going on here, you had, there was a, the battle lines were drawn out between the Philistine army and the Israelite army. There was a valley in, in the middle. And the Philistines, they had this really big, warrior. His name was Goliath, just a giant. And, you know, I guess they're pretty clever. They said, hey, if, if you guys fight our giant and you win, you know, we'll be your servants. But if you lose, then you guys will have to serve us. They figured they had the upper hand. Why not? I mean, they got a giant. So the Israelite army, they're, they're fearful. Even the king, I think scripture says his, his knees are shaking. But then you have David shows up. He hears about this. He was coming from the field, you know, guarding the, watching over the sheep. And his dad had sent him to the front line to, to take some supplies and things to the, his brothers. And then it, David hears, and it, this is uh, the conversation that he has with the king of Israel. Verse 32, it says, David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine your servant will go and fight him. And King Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. 
You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by the hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this this Philistine. David, he shares this his story of what God had done in his life in, in times past. And, you know, it must have been, it had to have been the Lord to have King Saul agree to let him fight. I mean, because in the natural, it's like this little boy is going to fight that, that giant, and if he loses, then we're all going to be servants. It's, it, it was the Lord guiding this. But he shares that there were times when a bear or a lion came and, and took a sheep from his father's flock, and he would go after it, strike the animal, and then take it back. And, and when the animal tried to turn on him and attack him, he, he would grab it by his hair and kill it. Now, I don't know if you noticed or not, but a lion and a bear, those are wild, wild creatures. <laughs> they got teeth, and they got claws. And they don't believe in tapping out, you know. <laughs> they're, they're in it to win. So David could have died. He could have died. And the thing about it is, David, he didn't say that he was so skilled with a sword. He, he didn't take on the credit for himself. Like, oh, you know, I did this, you know, my, my, I'm a skilled swordsman, or I'm fleet of feet, and he couldn't catch up with me. And, no, he said, God rescued me from the paw of the lion and God rescued me from the paw of the bear. And just like he did that, he's going to do the same for this giant over here. That's faith. That's faith. Church, the experiences that God has brought us through, we need to archive those in our memory bank. It might not necessarily have been a, a lion or a bear, but God has brought us through some things. He has, and we're still here. Some of us are, we, we're amazed that we are still here, but we are. God has washed over us. And the thing about it is, those are building blocks in our faith. Because the reality is, we're going to go through other things too. We are. Thank you, Lord, for, for bringing us through this difficult time. But down the road, there's going to be something else. That's life. We would have it be something else. We would have it not be that way, but we're not in heaven yet. That's, that's to come. That's the promise. But we're here now, and God is with us going through this, this, these, these situations in our life. Hebrews 11, verse 1 we started out this um, using this, Pastor Ryan did, when we first started in this, in this series. It says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. We don't have blind faith as Christians. We don't. We have seen God work in our lives. He's, he's done some wonderful things in our life. We have the Word of God. We read about that earlier, just listen, looking at, at David's account, things that he's done, his promises to us. And we've seen it in other people's lives. They've shared what God has done in their life as well. And I would say for parents, that's going to have to be true for our kids. They're going to have, have to have their own experiences as well. We, we, we share the, the Word of God with them. Uh, we have the privilege of walking the life of faith with them where they see God come through for us. But they're going to have to actually have those moments themselves where God's going to show up in their life. 
their, their foundation of faith is going to be solidified to him as well. But God knows how, he knows how to speak their language. Sometimes parents wonder, well, I, I, don't, I don't get you. But God, God gets them. He knows how to keep them. He knows how to restore them as well. That leads us to point three. It's that David had, had faith God would forgive him and God would restore him. He knew that God loved him, and if there was ever a break in the relationship between him and God, and uh, it was always going to be on David's side of the wrong here, but he knew that God loved him and that God would, would restore that relationship because that's what David wanted. He genuinely wanted, he wanted to please God. He genuinely wanted to um, be in, in God's favor. Even though he was a, a fallen man, even though he was an imperfect man, should I say. And there's an account where David, he, he messed up. He, he took another man's wife and plotted and had him killed. And, and this particular time, for some reason, he, he, didn't, he didn't get it that he was wrong. Probably did, but he, just, he was just pressing on. So God sends a, a, a prophet, Nathan, gives him this story and really just kind of lets him know, David, you're the man that's, that's in the wrong here. Sometimes that's us. Sometimes God will send somebody our way and it's like, where, where's that in the Bible? What, what chapter verse is that? that I, 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 don't, I don't see that. Sometimes God will have other people in our lives to explain things, to make, us, make it clear to us. And, I mean, just sitting here, coming on Sunday, I mean, we hear the Word of God and we have to line ourselves up to the Word of God. I have to line myself up to the Word of God. We're accountable to God's Word because He's right. He's the one that's right. So in Psalms, after he's confronted by, by Nathan and he realizes that he's in the wrong, he writes a psalm, Psalm 51. We're going to read some of the passages out of that from 1 down to 19. And we see how, we see David's heart. We see him turning to God. Verse 1, it says, Have mercy on me, O God. Because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner, yes, from the moment my mother conceived me, but you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Do not keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence, and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your ways to rebels, and they will return to you. Forgive me for shedding blood, O God, who saves then I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O Lord, that my mouth may praise you. You do not desire a sacrifice, or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O God. Look with favor on Zion and help her. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will be pleased with the sacrifices offered in right spirit, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls again will be sacrificed on your altar. David, he knew when, he knew he would find forgiveness from the Lord 
because he wanted it. He turned to God, as just we said before. He would, if he was going the wrong direction, he would turn and, and go the right direction. So church for us, when, when, we're, when we sin, we need to turn to God, not away from God. We need to turn to him, not, not from him. Sometimes the tendency is, is, you know, to get away because we feel like we're wrong. We are wrong, but we turn to God to find the help that we need. And I would say even if we're struggling with something, sometimes we have things in our life that seem to be overwhelming. We have a problem getting rid of. We need to turn to God with those as well. We need to turn to God and wait expectantly, like we had said before, wait expectantly that he's going to show up. and He's going to deliver us. He's not going to leave us where we are. He's, this work that he started in us, he's going to complete it. That's faith. That's David's faith. But the thing about it is, just as we looked in Psalm 51, there's a condition here for us, for our forgiveness. It requires us removing ourselves from that, that, that sinful situation. Because if we don't, if we don't remove ourselves from the sinful situation, we're, we're not sincere. We're not sincere or, or we're not repentant. But David, he positioned himself to receive that forgiveness from the Lord. And we see that in Psalms 51, he, he recognizes, and when he recognizes when he wasn't right, in the first three of Psalm 51, it says, for I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. He recognized his need for God. And in verse 17, it says, this is what you want from me, Lord. He recognized his need, and then he also recognized what God wanted from him. God wanted him. He said, the sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. So what are, our, what are our takeaways from this today for us? The first one is that, like David, we can have faith that God hears our prayers. We can have faith in that. We can count on him. We can count on his, his faithful love. And we need to wait expectantly as well that he's going to show up because he's good. And I would say even then, we, we can rest we can rest in God's faithfulness. The, the, the angst that we get about life sometimes, we can, that peace comes in, knowing that God's gonna show up, knowing that he's in control and we're not. The second is that we must remember the faithfulness of God. God has brought us through some, some things. And I've heard some of you, I know, have my own testimonies of what God has brought me through. He's brought us through some things. And we don't have blind faith. There's, we have a confidence in God. We have an insurance in who our God is. There's a, there's a substance to our faith, in other words. And, and if God has met our need in times past, he's going to meet him in the future as well. He's the same God. Same God. Same God. And the third thing is we can trust God's faithful love to forgive and restore us. We got to turn to him for it, though. We got we to position ourselves for that forgiveness. And when I was working on this sermon, I just kept God tugging in my heart, just the transparency of it, the transparency of it all. And God sees everything. He sees, he sees us. But yet he wants us. And yet he's drawing us to him as well. So he can change us because he loves us. And he's moving those things out of the way that, that hinder our relationship with him. He's, he, he wants to move them out of the way, but we got to come forward with him. And, and so we're just, we're going to open the altars, come forward. You know, if you have something in your heart that you need to, Lay before the Lord in, in faith, whether it be something that, Lord, I, I don't know if, 
if you, you can forgive me of this, bring it to the altar. Or we might have tried to do some things ourselves, like, Lord, I, I, I've given up waiting on you. I'm going to step out in faith, Lord, and trust you. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait on you, Father. Just as your word tells me to do, because we stand on his word. We don't stand on our own opinion. And you may just want to come down and, and just rejoice. Like, Lord, thank you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you that I'm not the same person. Thank you for creating this, this, this new heart you placed inside of me. So we're going to worship just for a few minutes. If you come down to the altar, somebody will meet you here. Don't worry. Somebody will join you in prayer. But altar is open.